بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله ومصطفاه نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهدى السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to lessons in fiqh as you know we're still studying the conditions of salat and we have mentioned few of them before so just as a reminder brother Fadi can you give me one of the conditions of salat purity purity and we mean by purity both sides of it which means that we have to uh, uh, clean ourselves and remove the filth the impurities and we have to perform ablution or total bath to remove the sexual impurity or to remove the hadith if one has this state of uh, 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 impurity on him do you have anything else brother Mustafa uh, facing the Qibla facing the Qibla and we talked about thoroughly uh, a few programs ago do you have uh, a third one Muhammad uh, facing the Qibla and uh, Noor covering uh, Aura covering the Aura and the Aura are the, the, the area in your body that must not be seen by uh, others. Abu Malik, do you have uh, another condition of Salat? Oh, I was going to say Satr Aura. We didn't, uh, it's it it deals else. with the times, okay. the sun, yes. okay. so which is? Times of prayer. Time of prayer. Yeah. So one of the conditions for uh, a prayer that the time is due. If you pray before it's due, then your prayer is not acceptable. We move on to Hadith 168, uh, uh, Hadith uh, narrated by Ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him. Narrated by Ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with them. Allah's Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, forbade, forbade prayer at seven places, a dump, a slaughterhouse, a graveyard, the middle of the path, a bathroom, and where camels sit at a watering place, and the top, meaning roof, of the Kaaba. This Hadith is not authentic. So it is weak, and that does not that does not necessarily mean that everything uh, mentioned in it is wrong. But it means that it's it's not something that we should rely on whenever we say that it is not permissible to pray in this area. Now, if we take it from the very beginning, it says uh, seven places: a dump. What's a dump? Abu Malik. Uh, it's a place where they throw, you know, trash and, and, and junk and waste. So it's like a junkyard where you put all the trash in. And <clears throat> again, there is no strong evidence supporting this. So if a person is living close to or was stranded in a, a dump and he had to pray, he must pray. Providing that he is sure, or at least he is certain that there isn't any najasa. And you cannot be certain that there isn't any najasa, but what is most likely that there isn't any najasa, so you pray, regardless. You don't have to do any tests or go to any labs to ensure that the place you're praying in is not najas. Because the rule of thumb is that everything in this world is Pure. It's pure, it's tahir. So, to prove otherwise, you have to have evidence. So, if I'm going to pray, on, and, and this is something that lots of people do, whenever I go and visit people in their houses, I usually ask for uh, 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 permission to pray. If I, if I skip sunnah, if I skip salah because of one re reason or the other. And to my surprise, people come to me and bring me a prayer mat you know the prayer mat and they say you can pray on this so I, I, I ask them why this why not pray on the floor the, the carpet the marble whatever they say well this is pure this is Tahir we know it's Tahir we don't know about the rest so is what they're doing right or wrong Mustafa what they're doing is right or wrong when they give me their prayer mats well, if it's the, for the intention of, 
of it being pure and the rest is not pure, then this is incorrect because as long as there's no filth on the floor, then so it should, you should be able to pray on it without having using the mat. Okay, this means that there is no need for putting a prayer mat. If even, and this happens, even if you are in doubt, saying that, I remember that one of my children urinated somewhere, but I don't know where. So does this mean that the whole area is forbidden for us to pray on? No. As long as you're not certain, then the whole area is considered to be tahir. And you don't have to go out of your way and put a prayer mat to pray. So, unfortunately, we find this also in mosques. See, it, it, shaitan, Satan comes to you in steps, bit by bit. So if he watches you, allowing him to whisper in your ears and not to pray in your house except on a, on a, on a, a prayer mat, after six or seven months, you will end up taking the prayer mat with you to the masjid. Do you see this in the masjids? People putting prayer mats or people putting their hand handkerchiefs on uh, uh, the prostration position. And when you ask them, why are you doing this? They say that, well, we're not sure, we're not certain that the carpets in the mosques are clean, are pure. If they're not pure and clean in the, mo in the masjids, in the mosques, well, where else can it be clean? And how can you ensure that the prayer mat you're carrying with you has not been uh, exposed to any filth or impurity? One of your children did something and you did not notice or anything that could have happened. So Iblis comes to a person and starts to whisper and make life really difficult for him. I had a friend, <coughs> excuse me, I had a friend who was a really good Muslim. And he used to sometimes deliver, you know, speeches in mosques and masjid. And something happened to him. And the guy started to have these whispers of Satan. And he listened to what he had to whisper. So at the very beginning, he used to pray in the masjid. And after a while, he started praying, skipping prayer. So when I visited him home, and I asked him, why do you skip prayers? He said, well, I've noticed that whenever I pray in the masjid, people on my left and right are coughing or sneezing or ha moving. You know, when you're pr in prayer, next, the one next to you starts picking his nose or, or, or rubbing his body. And some people get what we call uh, 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 skin diseases that are related only to prayer. They come only in prayer. They get skin diseases in prayer. When they're out, not praying, they're normal. They're, they're like us. The minute they say, Allahu Akbar, they start to have this itching in their body. And from the very beginning to the end of the Salah, you just find them jumping around, you know, just scratching and, 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 and rubbing themselves like monkeys. And this is un-Islamic. The minute they say, Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullah, it cools down. This is shaitan. So he said, this, this man, that I don't have any submissiveness and khushur. I cannot concentrate in my prayer without, with, with all this movement. And also the air conditioning, sometimes it's, it's too cold, sometimes too hot. Also, there, there, are, there is the noise outside of the mosque, you know, people horning and, and doing this and that. So I found out that whenever I pray in my home, I feel more secure and I... I benefit more from my prayer. So I told him, but this is not the sunnah. You are making a sin by not praying in the masjid. He said, well, I, I don't know. I had to figure it out, and I thought that this is the best thing to do. Two, three months later, the guy, it deteriorated. And he became too obsessed to the extent that he does not pray in anywhere in his house. There has to be a special room for his prayer and he prays in that room and ah, I forgot to say the first thing it started with when he used to pray in the masjid he, he used to pray with his eyes shut throughout the whole prayer and when I told him that this is not the sunnah this is the doing of the Jews and it's not allowed in Islam to, to shut your eyes throughout the prayer 
because neither the Prophet ﷺ nor his companions did it. He said, well, this is the way that I can get khushur. This is the way that I can con concentrate more in my prayer. And then he moved to praying in his house. And then he became obsessed not to pray except in a particular room with no air conditioning. And uh, w it was at the very end of the house. And six or seven months later, he began to pray only when he turns the light off. So he, he has to pray in complete darkness. And it wasn't long before he completely abandoned Salah. Khalas, he did not pray at all. He was so obsessed that shaitan, over, over, uh, uh, shaitan overcame him and khalas, he did not uh, uh, pray until he died. And this is a person that I know, I know him personally. He died not praying. Nasallah al -afiyah. So one should not be obsessed of cleanliness or of the absence of noise or of this or of that as it is un-Islamic. Now you have here, you have to pray in a dump. Nobody goes to a dump to pray. But if it happens, then as long as you don't see evidence that there is impurity, najasa, you may pray wherever you are. The second uh, uh, place is the slaughter house. And why is that? Slaughter house is like any other. What is not permissible for you to pray on is when there is blood of animals being slaughtered. Because the blood coming out from the animals is considered to be najis. And there is no difference among scholars in this. Adam al masfuh when it when it's pouring from uh, 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 the slaughtered animal, then this means that this area is najis. And people would hear this and say, you slaughter animals? How barbaric. Well, uh, medicine proved that this is the best and easiest way to kill an animal. They kill animals, some people kill animals by uh, hitting them on the head or uh, electrifying them or uh, doing this or doing that. This is all un-Islamic and unacceptable. By slaughtering the animal, you ensure in less than one or two seconds that the nervous uh, system is cut and the animal does not feel anything. And this has been proven. And even if it's not proven, this is our religion. This is the way that the Prophet ﷺ taught us how to do it. And the Jews slaughter, the Christians slaughter, the original Jews and, and Christians. It's only recently, like 50 or 70 years, that the people came to uh, uh, kill animals in a different way, not because it's more merciful, but because it keeps the blood in the body of the animal. So the weight, instead of being 100 pounds, it becomes 120 pounds, which means more money when you kill the animal and sell it. I believe that we have to break now. So please stay tuned. Inshallah, we will be right back. On the road to Medina, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and his companions faced lots of troubles and difficulties and enmities and obstacles in the way to Medina before the Hijrah to Medina from Mecca. Uh, also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has assisted his beloved Prophet and supported him in order to complete his mission and to, uh, uh, to immigrate to Medina. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, has granted us this great Prophet and his companions. Now the question, why the immigration to Medina, the Hijrah of Rasulullah and his companions, was a turning point in the history of uh, Hijrah in the history of Islam. My dear brothers and sisters, what are the sacrifices that the Prophet Muhammad has faced with his companions? Some of these difficulties, inshallah, we will learn together and we will focus in some lessons. What are the lessons that we take from these incidents, inshallah, in our program, uh, Road to Medina? My dear brothers, stay tuned with us, inshallah, in this great uh, uh, event of Hijrah. We will, inshallah, focus on some of the lessons uh, of in this program, Road to Medina. May Allah make it easy for us and accept our good deeds and gather us with our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu in Jannah. Amen.
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. Just before the break, we talked about the seven th things that were mentioned in the hadith, though it's not authentic, but we're just trying to go through them and see what's right and what's wrong. And we talked about the, a dump and a slaughterhouse. And we move on to the third thing, which is a graveyard. And it is forbidden for us to pray in graveyards. Some scholars say that this is because when a dead person dies and his remains uh, mix with the soil, this makes the soil impure and najis. And this is not authentic because his remains have been completely transformed into something that does not appear in the soil. So it takes the verdict of soil. But the reason why the Prophet ﷺ told us not to pray in graveyards is that if you pray in graveyards, there is a possibility that someday people will associate dead people with Allah Azza wa Jal. And instead of praying for Allah in a graveyard, you're, you will pray for the, the dead people or for the dead person. And this is apparent in lots of the Islamic country, countries, unfortunately where they pray and supplicate to the dead, as we see them uh, do that in lots of mosques and masjids throughout the uh, Islamic world. This is, of course, is associating uh, others with Allah, and this is called shirk. And uh, inshallah, we'll elaborate a little bit more uh, after uh, one hadith, inshallah, the following hadith. <clears throat> then it, it says, the middle of the path, and why do you think it's not recommended to pray in the middle of the path, Mustafa? Because people are passing by. And which would cause either you to uh, bother them in their way or them to bother you by passing in front of you in Salah. And you have the whole world. You only chose this uh, place uh, to pray and where, where they're in the middle of their path. This is not... Uh, uh, recommendable but is it haram is it forbidden no it's not so again the hadith is not authentic so we have to know which is right and which is wrong uh, what follows Muhammad Wh what's the uh, fifth or sixth thing um, bathroom bathroom now is this translation correct you remember we talked about it a couple of programs ago we said that the Prophet ﷺ did not have about bathrooms and what is meant by hammam is, Fadi? It is the place where people gather together to take... Uh, like a, it's like a public path. Like a public uh, sorry, that is public bath where they bathe in. The Romans used to do it uh, uh, in some Arab countries like in Tunisia, Morocco, Syria, and so on. They still have this. I don't know if they have it in, in Egypt, but I, I believe they used to have it like 30, 40 years ago. I don't know if it exists or not. Usually people go there <coughs> because they do, would not have the facility to bathe in their houses. But now everybody has a bathroom and they, everybody has a heater that, that heats the water and makes everything uh, uh, cozy and, and, and nice. Uh, so it's not recommendable to pray in a uh, uh, public bath simply because there are so ma a lot of aura. Uh, would be exposed. So looking at it, being in such a place where probably there is pure impurities uh, scattered everywhere, uh, water and, uh, that is not clean, it's not a proper place for a Muslim uh, uh, to pray in. And the following one was where, camel, where camels sit at a watering place. Now is this authentic? Is it allowed for us to pray uh, uh, in the barns or pins of, of camels? Noor? The, 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 the place where the camels sit. No, no. I think it's, uh, it's not authentic. It's? It's not authentic. It's the minute uh, if the place <coughs> is clean and pure, we can pray there. What do you think, Mustafa? I think there was uh, a previous hadith where we said that uh, the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ forbade praying at, uh, at uh, the near. barns and pens of camels. So it is authentic. And this part, we're not allowed to pray in the 
pens or barns of camels. And why is that, Mustafa, do you think? This is because the <coughs> this area is impure, because the camels let out uh, the droppings beauty. and the urine. Yes. Okay. Uh, what about praying in the barns or pens of sheep? It's the same thing. Mustafa? No, the, bar uh, the barns of uh, sheep, it's allowed uh, that you pray. So Provided that there is no impurity, but like... W where did you get this providing that there is no impurities? Just in general, as there any other place where you should pray in, there, should no, uh, there shouldn't be any impurity. Okay, Abu Malik. Well, uh, from I know that uh, animals that are, the meat is, you know, they eat, we eat our, their meat, it is, you know, their, their droppings and their urinate is not uh, nijis, mm. it's tahir. And that's exception for the camel, the camel is a different case itself, but the rest of them is halal. Yeah, w in their what barns. do you think of what Abu Malik is saying? Abu Malik is saying that it's a rule that the droppings and the urine of animals that we are allowed to eat their meat, such as birds, camels, cows, sheep, and so on. Any animal or bird that we are allowed to eat their meat, he's saying that their droppings, their uh, uh, urine, their dung is considered to be pure. Do you approve of this? No, no, Paddy? Yeah, I think so. I think he's right. Yeah, he thinks he's right. Well, he is right. The droppings of animals that we are allowed to eat their meat, animals and birds, is uh, considered to be pure. And there are so many uh, hadiths that back this up. For example, hadith al-Uraniyin, where the Prophet ﷺ Th these people that came to Medina and f fell sick. So the Prophet instructed them, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to go outside of Medina, where the camels are of the sadaqah, of the charity. And he instructed them to drink from their urine and their milk. Now, this seems gross, huh? Drinking urine of, 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 of camels? This is too much. Well, it is a cure to a lot of diseases and this is medically proven but I don't advise you to do it to any disease see medicine tells you what form of diseases they can cure so they may be able to cure skin diseases they may be able to cure some diseases with that deals with fever or with with uh, stomach pain but that doesn't mean they can cure diseases that deal with headaches or with um, bone uh, uh, disease, related disease or so on. So this, it is a cure and medicine has proven this. But even if medicine did not prove it, as I, as I said before, we rely on, only on the Quran and Sunnah. As long as it's authentic, we don't care if medicine provi uh, uh, proves it or not. But it, 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 is, it has been proven uh, medically. So uh, it is tahir to pray wherever you are in the, in the, in the, in the, the barns of, of sheep or of camels. But in the case of camels, you are not allowed to pray, not because the ground is not pure or tahir, but because of something else. That is why the Prophet ﷺ when asked, can we pray in the barns of sheep? He said, yes. And immediately he was asked afterwards, can we pray in the barns of camels? He said, no. So we have to follow it as it is. And it has no justification that we know uh, uh, at the present time. So we apply it as it is. <clears throat> and finally, it says it's forbidden to pray on top of the Kaaba, on the roof of the Kaaba. And again, this is not authentic. Now, one would say, who would go? to the top or on the roof of the Kaaba. Who will go there? Well, regardless, if somebody breached that place and went on top of the Kaaba either to do some maintenance or for whatever reason, that, is it possible for him to pray or not? Some scholars say, no, it's not possible. And, and the reason? Because he would not be facing 
the Kaaba, where will he be facing? And the same thing happens if a person prays inside the Kaaba. So the Prophet did this, huh? It's a sunnah if you can uh, uh, get away and get into the Kaaba. This can easily happen when they wash the Kaaba. And they do this twice a year, I think. And if you know someone, you could be lucky and get the chance to enter the Kaaba. Does it have any significance? Is it, you know, 1,000 times more or better than any other prayer? No, it does. It's not. The Prophet did it, alayhi salatu wasalam. Some of the companions did it. So it's part of the sunnah. And this is part of the sunnah that we should all try to follow. And why is that? Uh, uh, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal once performed cupping. He got a person to extract blood from the back of his neck or shoulders. This is called hijama. And he gave him one dinar, which is a lot of money. So those present said, Imam Ahmad, this is a lot of money. Why did you give this man uh, so much? He said, because I have reported a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ, uh, uh, it was said that he performed cupping and he gave the, the, the man who did the cupping a dinar. So I wanted to follow the sunnah. To that extent, they follow the sunnah. So if a person prays inside the, uh, 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 the, the Kaaba, then again, where will be, he be facing? Which direction? He, he is inside the Kaaba, so it's, it's understandable. And likewise, Islam is good for every time and place. If you are uh, on a spaceship, and you definitely you're not facing the Kaaba, you may pray wherever you are. So if you are on the top of a Kaaba, if you are on the, on the, on the roof, of the Kaaba, you may pray if you wish. And no one can say that, well, you have to come down and, and pray because you are in the Kaaba. So wherever you face, you're facing the right direction because as if you were inside the Kaaba, wherever you face, you're facing the right direction. So to uh, put it in a nutshell, all what you have mentioned, the Hadith is weak. Yet there are things that are authentic, and there are things that are not. And we have to try and enforce the things that are not authentic by authentic hadiths. Otherwise, it's not accepted and it is rejected. Um, we have other issues, but I think regarding this hadith, I think this is all uh, uh, what we have and need. And until we meet next time, fi amanillah. والسلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته <تصفيق>